Welcome to Pew Pew Panel with Ava and Chad. If you guys aren't familiar with who Chad is, he's worked closely with Iraq veteran 8088 for, what would you say, almost a decade now? Over a decade at this point, yeah. Yeah, and then you also started your own thing with Argos. That's um, right. Argos and that's what you've been pretty busy doing. Um, well, today we we both actually just got back from SHOT Show just a few days ago, uh, which we we're going to talk about. And then we're also going to talk about some of the new products released at SHOT Show. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, though, before we get into all of that, I uh, want to talk about Gideon Optics. So they have a 1 to 10 by 28 LPVO. And Chad, you were just checking it out. You were actually kind of, we, we both haven't gotten our hands on this but you were just uh, doing some research online and it seems to be a pretty good optic, um, even as far as like the weight goes and everything. Absolutely. So the one to 10 is kind of the the magic point in an LPVO. That's a low power variable optic. And these are typically used on your short to like mid range platforms. Say you got a normal 5.56 AR that you want to drop an optic on that can kind of cover all the bases and you can get that 10 power. Um, up and get out to medium to sort of long range, extended ranges. Um, but for an optic in this price point, a 34 millimeter tube coming in at 20 ounces roughly is a pretty good deal uh, overall. A lot of these cheaper optics um, or less expensive optics, I should I should say, um, they wind up in the uh, high 20s as far as weight goes. And it's like putting a brick on top of your, uh, your rifle, but it's got a glass edge, second focal plane reticle, uh, I've got adjustable windage and elevation, of course, 140 MA, MOA travel and half MOA increments, and you've got 11, uh, 11 red illumination settings. So there's a lot of features packed into this optic at a really reasonable price point at 399 on sale right now. Yeah, normally it's 499, but yes, it's on sale 399. Check it out, GideonOptics.com. All right, so today is a mail call. So while I was gone, I got a firearm in the mail. Um, not delivered to my doorstep, you know, unfortunately we don't live in that kind of country, but, uh, delivered to the gun store and I did have a chance to shoot it. It is the G force Raptor. I'll be honest with you. I'm not super familiar with G force. I've never shot any of their guns before. Um, just what I would think, I guess right away is, uh, very similar to like a Glock replica or uh, like an 80% gun that you would put together, maybe a little bit better than the 80%. Um, definitely has quite a bit of stippling on it. Pretty aggressive. I will say it kind of hurt my hands a little bit when I was shooting it. Trigger isn't bad. Uh, it's pretty reliable. Um, I didn't have any issues, even just kind of breaking it in. Even the first 50 rounds had no issues. That said, my sister got the exact same gun, and she was saying that even when she racked the slide, that it seemed like it was pretty gritty. And I know I was like, I didn't think that it was really gritty. It's pretty smooth, but she was also dropping her mags in the dirt. I think she dropped her gun in the dirt and she was like, yeah, eventually it wasn't, it wasn't firing. Um, so as far as like trust, stress testing goes, um, you know, I guess if you have one of these, don't get it dirty. I'll do my own testing, but this gun, what I liked about it is it ranged anywhere. I think it was like on average, like $350. It's optic ready. Um, comes with some pretty nice sights. Let's see if I can show you guys without lagging myself here. Uh, nice tritium, uh, or I'm sorry, not tritium. Um, what is this called? The, the, uh, the colored, the little colored things. Um, I can't even think of it right now. I feel like if if you guys only knew what we went through a shot show <laughs> and then having to record this just like a few days after and when we're playing catch up and still trying to catch up on rest and stuff like that and catching up on work, uh, it's been um, a really long week. Um, and then it also holds 15 rounds. So not a bad little gun. Um, but the reason why I told these people that they could send it and I would do a review is because I do like the way that they approached it. They said, hey, even if you don't like it, um, let us know. You know, you don't have to record a good review. We just want an honest opinion. And so I respect that. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it through the ringer a little bit more and then come out with a review for that. But yeah, I mean, I'm always I'm always down to 
you know, test out a gun that's in the $350 range because a lot of guns these days, I mean, cost an arm and a leg. And unfortunately, I don't think that that should be the case if you want, you know, if you want protection, you shouldn't have to go out and, and spend a ton of money for that. Yeah, there's definitely more options out there these days for uh, guns that fit every budget. You know, in previous yeah. years, you only had a couple of things to choose from on the bottom end, but now there's so many good guns out there. And I think that goes kind of hand in hand with new manufacturing techniques, um, you know, ways to make parts cheaper, different uh, finishes, like uh, the proliferation of like nitrided finishes, which are much easier to apply and provide a very, very high quality finish for the money. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but there's a lot of really great guns out there for, you know, every budget, like I mentioned. Now, as far as my mail call goes, it's not an empty box, I promise you. This is a rotor point. It's an offset red dot mount. But what's curious about these little guys is they are meant to clamshell onto, like, LaRue mounts. So if you guys are familiar with LaRue Tactical, they make a ton of different cantilever mounts for your uh, ARs and flat tops. But... The rotor point just kind of clamps on the front. Sorry, I'm trying to get this right in the camera here, but it clamps onto the front of the mount and it's just offset from the uh, pick rail on the fore end just a little bit here. But it just has a series of screws that help clamp everything on there. And you got a super low profile mount for your red dots. This one's for an RMR, they have them for T2s and other optics as well. But I've been really liking this setup a lot and. Uh, this gentleman approached me at one uh, shoot that I was at recently and sent one out to me just to kind of check out, and I'd never heard of them before. And, um, yeah, very interesting little thing for you guys who are LaRue fans. Uh, they have these for other optics as well, uh, and uh, optics mounts as well, but they're clamshell style. They don't mount directly to the rail, so they go with your optic on the great for optics mounts that don't have any sort of capability of uh, accepting a factory um, accessory mount uh, like some of the spurs and some of the other uh, you know higher end optics mounts that are out there but anyways wrote a point offset red dot mount for your hmm. LaRue's pretty cool nice yeah that is pretty cool I've never seen that either uh, all right so now it is the would you rather segment we did not have a question but if you guys just have a fun you know would you rather uh it could be anything. It could be something serious. Like, would you rather train in hot weather or cold weather? Would you rather eat pancakes or French toast? Or, you know, I mean, those are very serious questions. Or if you want something that's just kind of made up, feel free to ask us. Uh, best way to do so is email us at pewpewpanel at gmail.com. Same thing if you have any questions. Um, but before we go on and uh, answer one of the listener questions, uh, I wanted to talk about Rossi. Rossi just recently launched the Rio Bravo tactical rifle. It comes in black FDE or ODG. Uh, it has synthetic socks, Picatinny rail. It's threaded barrel, so you can you know you can suppress it if you wanted. It comes with a ten round uh, ten round tube magazine, and then has the sling mounts, uh, foreign accessory mounting slots, and then the low profile three dumb tail mount. The low profile three dovetail mount provides additional optic attachments, enhancing the rifle's adaptability. I didn't get a chance to check this out at SHOT Show. I wish I did, but I have to say that they've really stepped up their game and they've come out with just so many other guns than what we're used to. Um, I think, I mean, wasn't it for the longest time they were only making revolvers? And like lever, the lever actions and revolvers, but now they've branched out, branched out into quite a few different firearm styles. I think they even have... Uh, their own AR-15, if I'm not mistaken, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy how many like how many different companies, um, you know, are branching out to other stuff. Like even a Menchu Mag, who I had on my last podcast, how they're making chassis. They go from making magazines to chassis, and it's like it's actually pretty incredible. But if you guys want to check it out, Rossi, R O S S I U S A dot com. Today's listener question is, uh, I saw you, Ava, shooting the M3 grease gun submachine gun. Why did it come into service when we had the Thompson available? I did actually just put out just a quick little video, a reel on Instagram, and I think I added it to my YouTube channel as well. Uh, it is my dad's gun. It's really cool. It looks very futuristic if you guys haven't seen one. 
even though it's not futuristic. It's from way back in the day, but it looks like something that would be, you know, like in space kind of. And uh, really simple, just kind of like very basic parts, and it shoots 45 ACP. Uh, rate of fire is actually very slow. Just uh, similar to, there was like a Colt submachine gun that I shot as well, and the rate of fire was also really slow, which kind of makes it a little bit more ideal for it to be accurate when you're using it for, you know, in in war or uh, law enforcement and stuff like that. But, uh, Chad, I think you'd probably be better... Um, at explaining, I guess, how it, you know, came about and how it kind of took over the Thompson and, uh, you know, and, and why it happened. Sure. So uh, I think what you're going for is that Buck Rogers look. It does have that space yeah. look to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the M3, the, the grease guns, they came out in the mid 40s and they were meant to kind of streamline production of a 45 ACP submachine gun for our frontline troops at the time. And um, <clears throat> not to say the M1A1 Thompson wasn't a great gun, but it was just very complicated to put into production and uh, very expensive to manufacture. The grease gun's a stamped uh, firearm. It has very simple components, just a big old chunky round bolt. It's open bolt design. Um, yeah. You know, feeds from readily available magazines, and they can make them for a fraction of the price of the M1A1 Thompsons. And they do have that slower rate of fire. And, um, you know, they had kind of a insert barrel with a big threaded nut on them. So barrel changes, barrel swaps were very simple. They were very easy to maintain. They had a big old huge dust cover on them. Um, mm -hmm. So they they were actually used, I think, all the way up through the Korean War and maybe even saw some uh, minimal use or minor use in Vietnam as well. But um, they are definitely an interesting uh, design and an interesting gun for the for the history books for sure. Oh yeah, I mean, I don't. Mine didn't even have a safety. It was kind of just like, okay, insert the magazine, mm -hmm. pretty and much. Uh, and then even with it firing with the bolt open, also kind of throws you off. And then as far as like the dust cover, I mean, it's just this. It almost looks like a um, like a, on if you were grilling, like the top cover <laughs> of a grill that you just put down. <laughs> it was just. I was like, oh, okay, well, we're going to shoot this, but it was a lot of fun. And obviously I will never say no to shooting any sort of full auto. Mm. Uh, so that was good. So yeah, a little bit of a uh, little bit of slice of history for you guys. Um, now listener comments. So this guy, uh, Jay Treadwell Gmail, he said, uh, let's see, just lost my, my thing. He said, power responsibility must at all times be commensurate. Let me rephrase. Power responsibility must at all times be commensurate. My family never owned a gun safe or kept anything locked away. I was taught early to respect guns and knew touching them without permission meant bad things. We don't need more laws. We need more responsibility. A gun represents a great amount of power, particularly carrying a gun in public represents the readily available ability to take a life. These things should never be taken lightly. If you cannot be responsible with the power bestowed upon you and protect and protected by our great constitution, then maybe it isn't for you. Um, all that being said, I am not advocating that we don't need to store guns safely in our homes. Storage and education both fall under the umbrella of responsibility. Great, great topic. Keep them coming. And I, I gotta say, I mean, I do kind of agree with that. I know growing up, um, my dad always kept a loaded shotgun right by the side of the bed out in the open. It wasn't concealed at all. And my sister and I always just knew like, don't go in my parents' bedroom. Don't touch the gun. We knew it was there for. We knew what it was capable of doing, and we just weren't curious about it. And we had a respect for firearms. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, parents will go out of their way to teach kids responsibilities to an extent. Or if nothing else, they'll say, you know what, we're not going to tell them that we have a gun. We'll keep it, you know, up in a high shelf on a closet or something. And they're not going to touch it and we'll be good to go. But that's not always the case. So, I think that there's a lot to be said about one, demystifying that curiosity, but also taking out, uh, I mean, I guess, uh, embedding that responsibility in your children, whether you own a gun or not. I think that it's definitely a parent's responsibility to do so. It is for sure. And um, as a father of four children, I share that sentiment. Um, but you now I have a couple of gun safes and I keep every gun um, safely secured you know, stored in a humidity controlled environment, um, except my carry guns. Typically I have a lockbox by the bed 
So my carry gun will usually go in that uh, at night and during the day it's usually on my person. Um, but my children have been out to the range. They know uh, gun safety to a certain extent. I have children from 13 on down, um, each with different levels of maturity as far as uh, taking instruction and putting that instruction to use. Every kid is different. Um, the question comes up a lot, like, when should I start teaching my child gun safety and taking to the range? Well, it really depends on the child. But mm -hmm. it is it is in gun owners' best interest to safely store your firearms just as a personal um as a personal responsibility not as something that's forced on you by law i don't believe in safe storage laws at all i don't think we should be forced to store our guns under penalty of the law um but i think it is a, a good uh idea and it makes gun owners look uh good in the long run um you see stories of uh, sad stories, tragic stories of kids getting a hold of guns that are left out by parents who are very irresponsible and shooting themselves or hurting someone else, another child that might be in the house at the time, a friend of theirs. And these stories are tragic and they are wholly unavoidable or wholly uh, uh, avoidable uh, yeah. just with a few simple uh, steps in the direction of responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. All right, ATI Outdoors. So I guarantee you guys own a gun that uh, you could use an ATI, out, ATI Outdoors product for. I mean, literally just go on their website. All right, so I scroll under rifles and I'm um, going to have to look. So they have AR-15, AR-10, AK-47 for the CZ, 512, Enfield, High Point, Marlin, Mauser, Mosinagat, Remington, Rossi, Ruger. They even have stuff for shotguns, the uh, Sega, Remington, Rossi, Mossberg, Savage, Tristan Star, Winchester. And then uh, they also have Taurus handguns covered. So I guarantee if you guys are looking to, you know, to upgrade your gun and add some sort of part just to kind of differentiate it from, you know, any of the stock guns out there that ATI Outdoors has you guys covered, check it out, explore their website. Uh, they make really good stuff. It is atioutdoors.com. All right, so now it's time to get into the the main topic, which is SHOT Show. So I saw something kind of interesting on the uh, on NSSF's uh, social media page, and I kind of wanted to read it and touch upon it. All right, so apparently attendance was great this year. And I was even thinking to myself that I thought it seemed a little less crowded compared to other years. But then I was reminded, you know, this is my 10th shot show. And I was reminded that uh, Caesars Forum, they've only been doing that in the last couple of years. Before that, that didn't exist. So as a result, it wasn't as spread out as it is now. Um, but I guess in attendance, they had more than 55,400 industry professionals they offered 13.9 miles of aisles. When I tell people that SHOT Show is big and that you cannot see everything, like you just can't. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever walked every part of SHOT Show ever in my life. And I go there for the full, you know, four days plus the Monday for range day and stuff. Um, and I've never been able to cover it all. But so they have almost 14 miles of aisles, and this includes the Venetian Expo and Seizures Forum. Uh, more than 2,600 companies are present. Eight, uh, let's see, 821,000 net square feet and attracting attendees from 117 countries and all 50 states. And uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that's pretty impressive. Um, I did think that there would have been more than... Well, I don't know. So when I say 55,400 industry profess professionals, I have to, I mean, I don't think that that's all the attendees. There had to have been way more attendees than that. I don't know. Um, in previous years, I think SHOT Show has gotten up into the 70 and 80,000 uh, range for attendance. Yeah. But, um, as far as I know, they're, they're coining the statement the largest shot show ever because of the amount of companies that were represented there. I mean, 2,600 companies at shot and the floor space too with Caesars Forum, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. I, I know one person at least who walked the entire show, Ivan, uh, Kit Badger. 
Oh, really? Yeah, I was speaking to him, and he said, I just got done walking the entire show. It was Friday morning. <laughs> so, but I know at least one person who's done it. I don't know about that's anybody crazy. else. Damn it. Okay, so, well, I think that's crazy because Ivan is fairly well-known, and I would imagine that as he's walking on the floor, he runs into people that he knows, which is why I can't get, you know, past like right. 20 feet and then I have to stop and then, okay, I, all right, guys, see you later and go another 20 feet and then I have to stop and talk to people that I run into, which is great. Like, it's an awesome product to have or problem to have. And I love running into all of my friends and stuff uh, from the industry. But I just, I'm like, there's, I mean, I literally, every day I was there, I was on the floor. I think the show floor opened at 8.30. I was there between 8.30 and 9 o'clock every day. And only once did I take a lunch break. There was actually times, the, the reason why I took a lunch break is because I was thinking to myself, that I, I was like, I've gone like 24 hours without like a solid meal. And that's because dinner the night before wasn't really that great. I only had a few bites and I was like going to pass out. So I actually took a lunch break. But besides that, I was there for like the entire days up until five o'clock. And I still couldn't cover everything. Um, But I mean, yeah, it's, it's just, it's incredible. It's, it's such a fun event. I do love and hate it. My feet are still killing me. You know, we're talking about a few days later. When I got back Friday night, I went to bed at like 8.39. I slept. I was in and out of sleep all day Saturday, just catching up on sleep because I think I got like four or five hours of sleep a night, which wouldn't have been the end of the world. But then you're walking everywhere and you're just exerting so much, you know. Oh, it just, yeah, it was crazy. Um, yeah. All right. So let's talk about some of the stuff that we did because I know that my shot show is a little bit different than yours. That's right. Yeah. So I'm usually working the show. So we were, um, we were there to film for, uh, get zone. So we were doing the what's hot at shot segment that they put out each year and, um, working the show, you don't really get to see as much cause you're kind of bouncing between booths and, you know, scheduled visits and everything to try to get these pieces of content out. And I do everything, filming, editing, syndication, and it's just like lather, rinse and repeat. Um, yeah. Monday we were at industry day at the range. I was filming a bunch of B roll and, um, Tuesday morning, went to the show floor stopped at lunchtime, you know, after doing several pieces of content, uh, dropped some files, tried to edit a little bit, got back out on the show floor, finished the day out. We did 10 pieces of content that day, that evening we'd go back to the hotel. I'd get a little dinner, go back to the room, work until I crashed. And it was like maybe nine, 10 o'clock, woke up three o'clock in the morning, I'm like, well, all right, I'm up, get some coffee, back to work, go to the media room, upload stuff. I just repeated that cycle all week. And I finished out, uh, we did 28 videos and I had them all uploaded, syndicated to two YouTube channels and their platform all by Friday morning before the show opened. So I actually got to visit a few uh, people around the show that I wanted to see on Friday morning before we headed back. Um, wow. But I, I don't ever get to see everything at the show. And even yeah. bouncing around so much, you do run into folks, you know, and you get stopped and that delays you a little bit on your schedule. But um, it, it's been an impossibility for us the entire time we've been going. We never see everything. No. And people should probably know. So you're two hours ahead of, of Shot Show, right? Three. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're three hours ahead yeah, up over here in Georgia. So that's why you woke up so early and went to bed so early. Yeah. I was just an hour off, but I, I'll admit like, even when I did sleep, I didn't get quality sleep because I think I just had FOMO where I kept waking up thinking like, oh, I'm missing out on something. I need to be at a party right now <laughs> or just something. And I don't know. But um, so it wasn't good quality sleep. I also went to range day. Uh, range day, it was the, the weather was not great. It rained quite a bit. And it was it was kind of cold. I think it was in the 50s or like high 40s. But with it being wet, it just felt very chilly. And then it was mm -hmm. kind of and so I, uh, I was with the man, the man spot and then my sister and we went there together. We had to record some videos and I did what I had to do. And then I was like, all right, I'm getting back on that bus and, and warming up because I was freezing and then went back to my hotel, set everything up that night. I went to the Gundy's, which I wasn't planning on going to, but, uh, they personally invited me and I figured out hey, Monday night. What else do I have to do? I will say they put it together really well. It was definitely had like the Grammys feel because everyone was dressed formal 
and uh, you know that they had the red carpet and it took place in the Venetian theater. And it was just like a really good vibe. And then it was kind of nice to have like all of your friends like in one spot. And so I got to catch up immediately on the first day with lots of people that I hadn't seen in a few months. Um, the next day, first day at SHOT Show, like on the floor. And um, I kind of just, yeah, I, I was just like on the go nonstop. I had uh, quite a few booth interviews and uh, an appearance. Uh, what else did I have? Lots of dinners. Every night I had dinners planned with sponsors, uh, which is great. I love that, you know, like just going out and like meeting up with sponsors and just kind of solidifying that relationship with them. Because I think a lot of times, especially when it comes to um, companies in the industry, a lot of people are almost like making very similar things. And I think that what really separates products a lot of times are the people behind the company. And so I always like to solidify my relationships with the people behind the products so that, you know, I'm, I'm also like, I know that like, Hey, I have your back for your products, but then I also know that you guys are good people and you're worth sticking up for, or you're worth, you know, putting my neck on the line for, um, and I think it kind of goes both ways, but maybe I'm being too personal about it and being more of like, uh, maybe guys don't think of it like that, but I always like to have a good relationship. Absolutely. I think a lot of things in the firearms industry are relationship based, especially between content creators and the companies that they're representing. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the business that I've gotten and um, the leads have been by word of mouth and by references and such. And in this side of things, it's, it's kind of strange now being kind of on both sides. You got the media on one side and then I've got, you know, the shop and, um, you know, the manufacturing aspect el element of things, designing some products, doing all the hands on work. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys know, but I have a uh, FFL and SOT here as Arvis Ordnance, and uh, I do some light gunsmithing type work. I build rifles for sale. Um, any of you guys who know me from the channel, you've known that I've been very OCD about rifle builds over the years. I put um, a lot of attention into every one of these uh, builds that are going out the door. Uh, I recently got certified for Cerakote uh, back in October, so I apply Cerakote here at the shop um, on a factory level and the custom shop level. Um, do pin and welds, learn how to TIG weld last year, you know, a few other odds and ends, but pretty much a working gun shop at this point. I and mean, you can see what's behind me. This is the normal work workspace. And uh, one of my, well, on this side, one of my factory, uh, this is a six arc rig that I did in a multicam just recently as a demo piece. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool being on, on both sides, but doing a lot of the hands-on stuff is really where my heart is. Yeah, these days I just love, uh, I love when customers call up and say, Hey, we saw a video that you guys are doing, you know, this over here, you know, rifle speed installs and, uh, I'll get a call in and I get a customer and do some good quality work for them and they spread the word. So, well, I mean, and not to mention, I mean, for all that you've seen and all the testing that you've done and, you know, I mean, people, I, I have to imagine like when they're ordering products from you, like they're getting like the best quality just because you're like, I've been there, done that. You know, I mean, even with like your meltdown videos with you and Eric, like you've seen like what is typically the first thing to go wrong. And, um, and I feel like, you know, you, you've seen the experience, a lot of things that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to do, which gives That's you right. an edge on the competition. Got a bit of an edge. Yeah. But I just try to do things right. And, um, like you said, we've got some guns in in the past that weren't set up right out of the gate. They may have had some loose components on them. And, you know, these are guns that are thrown together on the assembly line. I mean, I, I use a 40 point quality control checklist with every gun I send out the door. And even the uppers are quality control checked and everything's test fired by me right now. So, um, um, you know, it's, it's pretty cool, but, uh, this is a great industry to be in and I've been happy to be in, been in it for the past, you know, gosh, 12, 13, 14 years and just, um, seeing how, seeing how the industry as a whole has changed and the customer base has changed. There's been a lot of, um, a lot of things over the years with more women getting into the shooting sports. Um, you know, a lot of different nationalities getting into shooting sports, um, you know, things like that, but it's really cool to see everybody kind of coming together as one huge community. And that's what we need these days, especially on the political front. Yeah. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, so I know that you, you mostly filmed and edited, uh, through shot show, but I mean, did you have like a favorite moment or was there something that you saw that you're just like, wow, that's incredible. You know, any, any favorite product? There was quite a few launches 
at Shasha this year, as with pretty much every year. But there were, um, I think, probably one of the coolest things I saw, and you know, take this with a grain of salt because I didn't get to see a whole lot of the show. Um, mm-hmm. But I was trying to meet the owner of Rifle Speed over at the agency booth uh, throughout the show, and I kept missing him. Finally, got together on Friday, but. Uh, at agency, they had Genesis Arms and a few other companies, Cloud Defensive and such over there. But uh, I was told to go look at a Genesis 5-inch PDW shotgun with a flow-through LE and mill-only Huxworks 12-gauge can on it. I'm like, huh, okay. <laughs> so this thing, it was like a kitty cat you know, yeah. rig, but it's a 5-inch barrel, 12-gauge autoloader and uses their kind of dual um action recoil system it, it kind of combines the features of an inertia system with that of an a5 so you got a little bit of a reciprocation in the barrel and then that inertia system takes over to kind of reduce that recoil and get that thing cycling uh some pretty light loads overall uh similar to like the old like benelli m2s they're pretty good at cycling a good wide range of shells but uh this thing was literally like it's like 24 inches long even with the can on there it was so tiny um, but that was pretty cool. And, uh, you know, agencies got their GPR rifle. So there's more companies that are putting the rifle speeds in their guns. And I like what agencies mm-hmm. doing. It's a little bit different than what I'm doing. I'm used to just using the standard blocks, but I use the rifle speeds in every build I put out here in the shop and, uh, they're fantastic blocks, but it was really cool to see all those companies kind of coming together in that one place. And Genesis has always done some really neat stuff with 12 gauges and, uh, you know, they've really taken the kind of AR style magazine fed 12 gauge to the next level for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. As far as rifle speed, I actually had the owner on my podcast and talked to him, but that's that was a, a really great design. The fact that you mm-hmm. can adjust, you know, the gas and stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, I will say, like, so my favorite, my like, what I got really excited about is. I think it was on Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday. It wasn't even the beginning of the show, but I was just kind of walking. I went to go see my friends over at Gators iPro, jumped on their podcast. And then when I was done, I was kind of just like walking around. It was in the Caesars Forum and I saw Real Avid and I've been familiar with their products for a while. Um, I don't think I own any of their products or if I do, it's just like a few things here and there. I don't own much, like too many uh, tools when it comes to, you know, like for for guns uh, my toolkit consists of something that i picked up from walmart a toolkit and it is teal <laughs> and uh all the stuff that i've been doing in my gun um i have like a a free little uh punch toolkit that i don't know came in some giveaway bag that i've been using it's like it's really pathetic and it's embarrassing and then if i don't have the tool maybe sometimes i'll go and borrow it from my dad but i do not have a great setup at all and i will say that after being in the industry for 10 years, um, the thing that I've been, I guess, less inclined to do is work on my gun. One, because it takes some time, but two, I've just been just nervous that like I'm not going to put it on properly or it's going to mess something up. And now I, my gun has issues and I have to bring it to a gunsmith. So I usually just either I had my ex-boyfriend do it for the longest time or I would just drop it off at the gunsmith at the range that I'm an investor of. But now I'm like, all right, you know what? It's time to step up my game and I need to stop relying on all these people and I need to do my own stuff. And so I was talking to Real Avid and um, initially I was talking to one of the VPs, super nice guy. And then I asked her, I was like, do you mind if we record this? Like, I just thought it was so amazing. The stuff that they had just put out for 2024. And he was like, you know, I, he's like, why don't we have one of the engineers jump on? So this guy, Mike, who's one of the engineers, he jumped on my video. So it's, it was kind of out of his wheelhouse because that's not what he typically does. And then, um, me, I went by myself to range day or I'm sorry, not range day to shot show. And so I didn't know it at the time, but it was the VP. I asked him, I was like, well, would you mind just like doing my camera, like holding the camera? And he was just like, yeah, sure. I don't mind. And only after the video was recorded. Did I then later find out they were like, yeah, you just had the VP record all of your, like do your film work. (laughs) So they were laughing about it. But um, anyways, they came out with some really cool stuff. So they had their like master vice with their like, uh, what was it? Like the two fit jaws. What I really liked about their vice, and this has been out for a little while. It's not a 2024 product, but it has like that ball um, thing to it. So it will, it'll move. 
So if you need to like move the gun up or move it, you know, accordingly, it's not just like a solid advice that it's like, okay, now you have to work around it depending on, you know, what you're doing to your gun. So that was, um, that was just really convenient. Uh, they had their, the boar boss, um, kind of similar to like their boar snake, but it's this little tube thing and it attaches to this ground thing and it makes it easier to pull out. But then it also, you can store it around, like you just wrap it up and then you just put like this, um, this like kind of, what is it? It's like a flexible plastic. I don't know what it's called. Um, but that thing keeps it like nice and clean so that you're not getting like gunk all over the rest of your cleaning stuff. They had the, uh, they, they did put out like a really cool cleaning kit that had like three different layers to it. And that one, I will say I was probably less excited about, I would totally use that, but I'm not the best at cleaning my guns. And I'm sure a lot of people are like, oh, what do you mean? Like there's some guns I've never even cleaned. And we'll just say I'm just, you know, it's for testing purposes. Uh, they had the Bench Block Pro and then the Master Bench Pro, uh, Block Pro kit. And um, I just all of those things. So if you guys go on their website, I don't think it's going to be available on their website or shown on their website for a few months. But I would say definitely check out their website in the meantime because they still have so many cool things. And if you guys are like tired of relying on other people or gunsmiths and you want to take it to the next level, check out Real Avid. Their stuff was just like good quality stuff. And it really was pretty affordable for, you know, for what you get and for like the tools that I've seen, like in, you know, like Home Depot and stuff like that. So. I've got one comment about their master gun vice. Uh, I had a customer come in and um, I was building out an upper for a buddy of his. Uh, he had a Grey Ghost upper with... Uh, upper receiver with one of the Roscoe 12 and a half inch uh, K9 barrels. They have an intermediate gas system. So mm -hmm. I wound up having to make a custom tube for him for the rifle speed block. Um, I just took a, a longer gas tube and turned it down the lathe to the proper length. But, um, and uh, the barrel had to be thermal fit. And he was asking me what kind of vice I use. I said, well, I just use an old machinist vice. It's just like a you know, machinist vice with the pipe jaws and everything in it. It's just a big solid hunk of cast iron you know no big deal um he said well have you seen these real avids i said huh like, what are you talking about so he actually brought it into the shop uh had to order some parts in for him he came back he showed it to me and we didn't mount it up or anything but he was just showing me some of the features and i'm thinking i don't wonder how much torque i can put on this thing but i was uh over at the real avid booth just checking the products out and we put um a pin okay they've got a pin system where you you put the vice back in its stationary position uh with the jaws up and then you can put a cross pin through the ball joint and it locks everything together and he said you could put 100 foot pounds of torque on it uh, no problem and i like literally just put my hands on the vice and i just jumped up and held myself up on it on on this rolling workbench they had and he was like "Ooh." um but I mean, the thing seems pretty solid for like kind of the at home builder who's just a hobbyist and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, I could probably use one in the shop uh, just for the articulating function. There's a lot of times where I'll need to turn a workpiece a certain angle mm -hmm. to get a pin out or be able to see what I'm doing, especially if I'm, uh, say, polishing some feed ramps or whatever the case may be. Um, I like to work at a certain angle, and that vice would probably helped me out here in the shop and they do have a bunch of different uh insert jaws they had one for suppressors that was one of the first things i asked i'm like do you guys yeah. have insert jaws for suppressors so you can clamp your can in there and then you can use your um your rent whatever wrenches you need to span a wrench or uh like a nipex or whatever to get your muzzle devices or your your mounts off or that sort of thing or reinstall parts and pieces uh, pull them apart for cleaning. It helps to have something that can clamp around that circumference and give you a lot of surface area to grab onto because they they tend to just slip around unless you make wood jaws for them. But they really have thought of uh, some great ways to help the general you know firearms consumer right. out there with a great product. Yeah, they also have like their smart dock system and yeah. it would hold. So it had like a magnifying glass, a light, and then um, a tablet holder. So if you were watching YouTube and like doing, you know, whatever at home, um, so it just, they thought of everything. I thought that all their stuff was like really pretty ideal and, and I was pretty impressed with the quality. So hopefully, um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to set everything up exactly how they had it laid out at SHOT Show and, and have, I'm, I'm going to become a gunsmith. That's basically what I'm trying to say. <laughs> all you need is, all you need is YouTube, right? <laughs> all right.
Um, I think before we start talking about the new guns that came out, we have a list of them. I wasn't able to see all of them. Either was Chad, but we're going to name it and kind of just talk about them. But before we do, let's talk about electronic transfer. And um, Chad, you actually use them. It's a it's a merchant service. You use them for your store. And I believe, did you meet them when they came to your range day? I did. Yeah. So I got to meet um, several of the uh, folks that I've chatted with on the phone and that helped me get set up with electronic transfer. But they're a very firearms friendly merchant processor. And, you know, as you guys know, there's been a lot of uh, negative press um, for the gun industry in the past several years. And a lot of merchant processors have pretty much just shunned gun companies and retailers from their merchant accounts. Uh, and a lot of times they'll just cancel you outright. And then all of a sudden you've got an e-commerce platform that you can't take payments on because you've been canceled. Uh, e -con e uh, electronic transfer will never do that to you. Uh, they're very 2A friendly, very firearms friendly. And uh, they actually helped me get my account set up specifically for GunBroker. I needed a payment processor to be able to accept credit cards on GunBroker and they were immensely helpful and got me through the whole process with relative ease. And you know, their fees are very, uh, very fair. The monthly, uh, you know, fees are affordable, especially for a small shop like mine. So it really fits into the budget quite well. Yeah, that's nice. I didn't know that they had that uh, ability to get you set up with gun broker too. Mm -hmm. that's, Absolutely. You know, that's huge. All right. Uh, let's see here. So some of the new guns. Um, all right. So we had the Smith & Wesson. They had their lever action. There was actually quite a few lever actions that that launched i saw even uh stag arms aero precision aero precision had a tactical lever gun that looked really cool i'm hoping to get my hands on that um daniel defense they have a new handgun well they, they have their only handgun they released their first ever handgun and it is the h9 if you guys think back to a few years ago i'm trying to think when the hudson h9 came out i want to say it was like in 2018 2019 mm. and um they had, I mean, it was a couple that designed the gun. They had a really incredible story, and lots of people love that gun. I remember shooting at the range, and it shot really well. Um, but unfortunately, I think it was like two or three years in, and they went out of business. And so Daniel Defense, I guess, I, from my understanding, I think they bought the machinery or something, and they have brought back the H9. I did an interview with Daniel Defense, and unfortunately, none of the old parts or even the gun for that matter, is compatible with any of the new stuff. It's not the same gun. It looks like the same gun from the outside internally, though it is not. So if you guys bought an H9 and you were like, cool, finally, you know, I could maybe send it to Daniel Defense to fix if it broke or something, I don't think that's going to be the case, unfortunately. Well, I'm glad that a company like Daniel did take over the design because it was a, uh, a great concept. Um, yeah. super low bore axis, very unique recoil system um, to keep the felt recoil down to a minimum, you know, for faster follow-up shots. Uh, just a really cool design overall, but it did have its, uh, you know, gremlins for sure. And, um, yeah, we were speaking with Daniel Fence while we were over there filming uh, as well, and um, they were just, <laughs> they were reiterating the amount of time and ammunition that was spent basically redesigning the internals of that gun from the ground up. Uh, we were told that they spent 11 or uh, they, they uh, sent 1 million rounds down range in testing to make sure that that gun was good to go over the wow. course of the past several years. So That's crazy. crazy. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Beretta uh, launched the 30 X, which is chambered in 32 ACP. It's, it's essentially just like a pocket handgun. Um, what I liked about that, though, is I was talking to my friends over at Federal, and they recently took 25 ACP and 32 ACP and uh, came out with sort of a new new uh, self-defense round. Um, they've, well, they sort of, I guess, uh, made it better, and uh, which I, I thought was kind of cool because they're definitely catering to people who, you know, in that little small niche of people that do carry that for self-defense. And so they were like, all right, well, if that's what you're going to carry, we want to make sure that you have the best ammo. So um, so that's kind of cool. I do wonder if more people are going to come out with guns that are chambered in those two calibers. Um, uh, probably I could see because uh, 
modern, as you well know, modern ammunition manufacturing has taken a huge step forward. And a lot of the available powders uh, that are out there now, they have much higher performance than their um, older counterparts. So you can push these small projectiles and these small, uh, like concealed carry cartridges much faster, delivering more energy on target and getting overall better performance, lower flash. I mean, there's a lot of different factors uh, that these new powders uh, will give you in the ammunition department. But um, the Tomcats and Bobcats are pretty interesting because they're a tilt barrel design, as you well know. So mm-hmm. they're really nice for folks who may have had, may have a little less hand strength to be able to pull a slide back. Um, I recently had some customers in the shop uh, they called me and said, hey, I have a, a, a River LCP. I can't pull the slide back on. I think something's messed up. They just didn't have the strength to pull the slide back and chamber around out of the magazine. Uh, with the Tomcat design, you can basically insert the magazine, tilt the barrel up, drop around in, and then push the barrel back in place. And now you have uh, a handgun that's ready to go. If you want to unload it, all you do is tilt the barrel up, pull the live round out, close it back. You still have a full magazine in the gun. So it's very convenient for you know those type of folks. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, River came out with their LC Carbine 45, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, I mean, it looks cool. I wouldn't say there's anything like, you know, really. Oh, uh, H&R, they have the M16A2 LMG. I wish I would have saw this thing. It's very retro looking. Yeah, I, I need this, actually. Yeah, so the LMG was uh, an old, um, I think it was produced in Canada, but it was a light machine gun, um, open bolt, 5.56, of course, uh, but it used a very, very heavy profile barrel uh, with a, a reinforced gas tube and some other features to you know, pretty much allow it to have sustained fire capability, um, yeah. you know, much similar to like a belt fed, but a very, very heavy, heavy gun overall, has a really unique uh, rectangular handguard up front. Um, and it fires from the open bolt position, at least the, you know, the, um, the machine gun version does, but I love that H and R is now releasing this super classic retro rifle out there. You just ne- don't see these and it's just really neat in that retro line. Yeah. Uh, let's see what other things, uh, Scorpion, CZ Scorpion, uh, they released the Evo chambered in 22. It looks the same. Uh, it does come with a threaded barrel. Um, I don't know if I'd get that or not. I mean, it's cool. You know, 22 is fun to shoot, but, uh, PSA, I gotta say they probably stole the show, uh, or they took a, a huge chunk of the show. They have just been really like on their game lately, as far as like all the stuff that they're releasing. Because I know, like, even a few years ago, PSA products were just like, eh, you know, oh, PSA, you know, you got that kind of like, you know, like, it, it just wasn't good quality. And now they're coming out with stuff that is just very innovative. And then the quality is there as well. They came out with just a handful of stuff, just to name. This isn't everything that they came out with. So the X57, uh, which is very similar to, like, an MP7 lookalike ish i also think it kind of has like oozy vibes to it too um yeah i wouldn't i would like to shoot that they have the oh this one's cool the psa thumper 37 millimeter flare launcher i would add this to any of my ars oh yeah so it's got more of a classic style like an old 203 uh mm-hmm. so for you retro guys out there i mean this kind of completes that look uh definitely a lot more classic than some of the other offerings that are on the market um, they also have uh, what nine millimeter jackal. You said I didn't see that. I saw a bullpup concept. Yeah, I didn't see that one either. And I'm I'm annoyed. Well, I'm kind of annoyed at myself because I stopped off at the PSA booth. It was Friday, and I what people may not may or may not know is inside these booths. So if you see like you know maybe it's like a squared cutout. You know they have all the guns and stuff on the outside. Well, inside there's usually like a little office, like a hidden. <laughs> A little hidden office or like a little place that people have meetings and so i stepped in back there to talk to uh the owner's brother and we were just kind of catching up on stuff nothing we weren't really talking about anything crazy but i'm i'm kind of like annoyed with myself that i didn't take the time to really look at what was on the wall but i have to say by friday you are just it's like 
you, you know, it's like being like seeing so many different advertisements, how we do every day that like you just, it doesn't even resonate anymore. You're just like, oh, cool. <laughs> Another gun, you know? So I really didn't pay attention too much to like what was on the wall, but, um, but yeah, I guess they have the nine millimeter Jackal. The Jackal is just a good looking gun. My sister has it. She really enjoys it. They also came up with a new shotgun, uh, the 570, which shotguns, you know, whatever. I don't, I could give her, you know, like take or leave, I guess. Well, this one has some interesting features. I, I never made it over to the PSA booth. I was trying to get back over there because everybody was talking about it. Um, yeah. But the 570 is uh, a Mossberg pattern clone, more or less. It has the uh, standard tang safety in the rear. But one unique feature that I noticed was that the uh, slide release is on the right side of the receiver, kind of right in the trigger guard area. So instead of the slide release being like, you know, yeah, you got to reach forward and you know, push the lever and then pull the slide to the rear to uh, yeah. initially uh, chamber and everything. Um, you've got that button right there on the side of the receiver, so you don't really need to change your hand position. And the receiver extent or the uh, the magazine tubes, uh, they actually thread in place at the receiver. Uh, they're not press fit or anything with a pin, and then um, tensioned with the uh, installation of the front cap. It looked almost like it had a, a, a like a barrel nut on it, almost uh, kind of like the Remage type barrels. Um, but definitely a unique feature. I'd like to get my hands on one to check it out a little bit closer and see yeah. how they do. They had a lot of bolt actions too. I saw that used uh, Remington 700 pattern receivers and then Remington style barrels with the Savage style barrel nut. So everybody's kind of getting into shotguns and bolt actions, which is yeah. you know, just increasing their lineup, which just gives them more more customer base. I mean, yeah. I think it's great. Yeah, that's a good point. They also had the STG 44 which is kind of like the clone of the STG-44 machine gun, yeah. um, which you were saying actually before the show started, to your, like you think it was the first successful machine gun, submachine gun out there, right? Well, it was the first successful like actual assault rifle, a real assault rifle. Um, you know, in a time when uh, the weapons of war were bolt-action rifles, you know, and then uh, different types of machine guns, so big water-cooled machine guns at the time, there was no such thing as like a you know, man portable submachine gun that shot a, a lighter cartridge um, that could be effective in in close quarters combat until the development of the SCG forty four as a German design, uh, you know, stamped sheet metal construction, uh, very unique and very futuristic. I mean, this thing was way beyond any of the technology that was out there at the time when it was released. It was chambered on the 7.92 by 33 curves, uh, curves for short, uh, you know, very similar to like your 7.62 by 39 as far as the uh, the way the cartridge itself looks, but a very effective, you know, um, gun overall initially on, but, um, you know, throughout the war, the, the cost to produce it just became astronomically high. They had supply chain issues trying to get parts and components and, and materials, uh, you know, to the manufacturing facilities for these things, and they just kind of fell by the wayside, the cheaper designs, very similar to what we mentioned with the Thompson and the grease gun earlier. Um, yeah. But it was literally like the first real deal submachine gun ever created, and pretty much every modern design that's out there is – you know, loosely based and inspired by the SCG-44. Wow. Yeah, I gotta say, like, as much as, you know, I don't want to give them credit, the Germans, because of, like, the Holocaust and stuff, they really were ahead of their time. I mean, even my dad has said that, like, this, the, you know, the stuff that they came out with was just, like, light. There are some, some brilliant minds in Germany, yeah. and, you know, it, it it's a... It's a shame, but I mean, history is history. But you know, you have to give credit where credit's due, and they did have some amazing designs that came out of yeah. the war and such. Um, now, all right, so you mentioned PSA had the X five seven. Tommy Bill has the real deal, like semi auto MP seven clone, like a real deal clone available now I know. or soon, I should say. Yeah. But it comes with a hefty price tag. I mean, yeah, PSA has got the. They've got the MP7 at home, and then you got the real deal with the Tommy. Yeah, right. Right. Although, I don't know, like some of these PSA guns, though, I will say, like, it's not your typical PSA pricing anymore where you're like, oh, yeah, five, six hundred bucks. You know, I mean, 
a lot of this stuff is still a little over a thousand dollars but a, a lot of their designs are also using a lot of proprietary parts you know very unique designs uh, you know they're trying to keep the manufacturing uh, cost down to a minimum but when you're talking about uh, like the jackal for example i mean those have some specialized components in them that you know you don't have millions and millions of parts available out there like your standard ar-15 so it's more of a specialized niche so yeah i could you know the price is up a little bit higher but yeah. it's also a unique gun so yeah yeah oh anyways yeah the tommy built t7 that's another gun i did not see although i wish i did i wish that like I was saying, I wish that there was like a list before we went to SHOT Show and there's always that new, what is it, new product area. And mm -hmm. anytime I've gone, I'm like, this isn't even the stuff that we want. Like it was like, oh, today, you know, they came out with these new gloves with this new technology and it's so much more breathable. But like they don't really highlight a lot of the new stuff that people are talking about. It, it doesn't seem like it's like as up to date. So I just stopped going to like the new product area, which... I don't even know where it was this year, to be honest with you. I, I mean, that ship kind of sailed, but yeah, and I didn't know either. I was able to get to the supplier showcase, but I never was able to get up to the new product showcase. But as you yeah. mentioned, they don't really show the stuff that people are talking about for the yeah. most part. Yeah, uh, Foxtrot Mike Barrel. Uh, we, you know, you actually you recorded me interviewing uh, Paul, which I feel so bad. In the last show, I called him Mike, which is so easy to call him Mike. Because I'm like, all right, Paul, why didn't you call it Foxtrot Paul instead of Foxtrot Mike? <laughs> um, but he, a uh, total genius. I mean, he came out with this barrel that includes the the bolt, uh, the barrel, and the muzzle, and it's all one piece. I think you mean the... The gas. The, the gas, yeah. So it has the, the barrel itself, but the gas block and the muzzle device and the extension are all integral they're all turned into the barrel machined into the barrel so number one you get perfect co-centricity so there's no chance of you putting a suppressor on and it being out of spec and you wind it up with baffle strike and word on the street is there's going to be multiple muzzle devices available on these integral barrels uh starting off with the dead air chemo just a two chamber break design but the gas box unique in that it's a 45 degree Mm -hmm. um so the gas has an easier time flowing through it doesn't generate as much heat and friction right there and the gas tube that paul had was a very beefy and robust gas tube mm -hmm. and the extension is a larger size it's an ar-10 size extension with a special large bolt that has a massive webbing on it so you know you hand loaders out there i mean we all know what bigger bolts mean it means bigger loads of powder more power more pressure more velocity um, mm -hmm. so without running the risk of breaking your standard AR-15 bolt. So this will be awesome. And when he starts offering them in like the six arcs or six, five Grendels that typically suffer from that real thin web on the bolt face and are prone to breakage with overpressure hand loads and such that are kind of outside the spec of normal commercial ammunition. Um, but what, what they're doing is great. And there's already one company, Ava, that is using, uh, Fox Trot Mike's barrels in their production rigs global ordinance right yep absolutely yeah so excited to get my hands on that uh they have the monolith um halston also came out with some uh some new stuff i guess yeah i mean i will say last year halston kind of stole the show with their night vision uh, it was the drs and the and i guess they've added to that lineup i did not check out their booth Although I will tell you guys a funny story. Um, so I accidentally got my hands on the DRS NV, and this was in July of last year. And I thought that it had launched. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how I got it in my hands. It was a total accident. And I was like, oh, I'm, I looked online. I was like, there's no reviews out on it. I'm just going to quickly like record a, a, a review. And so I did like my entire video. And then I was like, you know what? It is kind of weird that there isn't any reviews out on it. I had some friends over at Halston. I was like, you know what? Just so I don't step on any toes, I'm just going to message them and just be like, hey, is it okay if I release this? And sure enough, like they went into action. They were like, oh no, we got to put out this fire. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so they were like, that should not have been in anyone's hands. What are you doing? They were really nice about it, um, but I don't know if they actually even come out with it yet. If they've released it, they said that when they do, that they'll they'll send it to me. I do have my video ready to go. 
I could have been a jerk and released it and gone viral. But honestly, I don't, you know, I don't have any interest in doing that to anybody in the industry. If it was my product and it was prematurely, you know, released and, and I already know, uh, they were saying that like a lot of things are going to change on it. Um, so I'm sure that even the video that I have done is probably going to be, it will have to be redone because the buttons and stuff probably aren't even the same. Um, but yeah, a little funny story that I don't think I've shared with the, the public that I had that. Uh, but they did come out with the DPS, night vision, and thermal, the RAID, and then the SCS. Um, Halston, I've, I've always been really impressed with their stuff. It's pretty good quality, and they've kept the price point very low for what they offer. Uh, let's see, CZ600 Trail. Um, that, I don't think, really did much for me. It looks kind of, let's see, I just pulled it up. Uh... Oh, it's okay. So it's new. It's a new rifle chambered in a 300 blackout. So the trail is, is kind of, a. it was new last year, but they have a couple of, um, kind of chassis style models with the sliding stocks and they released a seven six two by 39 and a five, five, six, uh, last year, maybe the year before, but one of the big selling points was supposed to be barrel interchangeability. And, uh, they had a lot of issues with, um, the barrels and retaining accuracy and you know, just being good shooters in general. So they went back to the drawing board, removed the barrel interchangeability feature and just made them standard guns chambered in whatever you got out of the gate um, with a standard thread and barrel instead of their set screw system. But uh, they've released a 300 blackout version of that, which that's kind of the gun that I was looking for a while back, just mainly for suppressor metering and such, like kind of a neat bolt action that, kind of fit ability it could you know the stock could slide in you could make it a little bit more compact and i thought it'd be a really handy uh like sbr cutting the yep. barrel back to maybe nine inches or so and throwing this little short can on there that gave you a nice compact package that you could just about throw in a ruck and have you know five five six or three hundred blackout capability pretty readily um, but they've got some classic versions as well it's just kind of a new line of bolt actions for them uh, i think they've got an american series they've got some of the more european style with the nice walnut wood stocks um, but i've always been a huge fan of cz anybody who's watched the channel knows that we've always really loved the cz products over the years but um i, I like the trail and i think it's pretty cool but um so silencer code they've got some new cans right um everybody's kind of been going through these new flow through designs, but they've got a Spectre 9 yeah. out now, which uh, the Spectre as uh, one of their older 22 cans. They've got kind of an upgraded version for 9mm that fits into a nice budget price point. And then their Velos, they've expanded that lineup. Those are their low back pressure flow through style cans, uh, sort of traditional baffling with some internal venting uh, just to reduce that back pressure on your semi auto uh, applications. Actually, so uh, have you heard of the company Disavowed Group Suppressors? Uh, no, not until you reached out the other day about them. And I thought the claim was pretty pretty uh, dubious, to say the least. Yeah, but I don't know. So I, I saw like a quick, um, just a, a really quick interview with uh, Grand Thumb, uh, Mike, and then uh, Clint Morgan from Classic Firearms. And it seems like they're doing something that is pretty unique. Um but I, I was like, it was even hard for me to wrap my mind around it. But essentially, they're just kind of eliminating, you know, like kind of, uh, how do I explain the it? The way you said it was like they eliminated the sonic crack of the projectile out to 150 yards, which uh, I'm, but I just, I just don't feel like that's impossible to do because the projectile is moving, okay, outside of that suppressor. And yeah. the suppressor is designed to, capture that muzzle blast and reduce the sound pressure levels at the muzzle and at the shooter's ear, right? But as that projectile is traveling at supersonic velocities, it's generating those pressure waves, all right? And those pressure waves are going to propagate. No suppressor is going to stop those pressure waves from propagating once that projectile is outside of that environment. And yeah. the you can shoot like a, you can shoot a 5.56 AR at about maybe 10 to 15 feet away from a burn and you'll just get that loud thump. You won't get a sonic crack because the waves haven't had enough time to propagate. Um, but outside of that range, 25, 30, 40 yards and onwards, 
those waves propagate, those, that sound pressure comes back to your ear and, you know, it's traveling way above the speed of sound. So it's going to generate those sonic booms, sonic cracks that you normally would hear. Um, I, I just don't see any way of mitigating physics in that way. And there's been, uh, some, there, there's been some imaging technology that you, you can find out there on the internet It's called uh, Schlieren imaging. And it uses a series of parabolic mirrors and special camera angles to record sound pressure waves. You're, you're basically recording the shadow of the sound pressure waves. And uh, if you guys follow Smarter Every Day, it's a great YouTube channel. Uh, he just he takes a lot of things and just puts a scientific back, backing into it. And he did one episode on the Renner Blackout and the Schlieren imaging technique, and I thought it was very interesting, but you can literally see those pressure waves between supersonic and subsonic projectiles, and you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. But I don't know. I'd have to see some data to back up those claims and maybe some testing, but look, I'm going to say this, and some people are probably going to hate me, but a lot of folks out there, they'll do some testing with, like, especially with suppressors, they'll use like those Amazon sound meters, right? And they're not made for it. They, they just can't handle those impulse pressures. You know, yeah. the, the mics aren't set up for it and they'll put out these results thinking that they're like, they're actually doing science. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of suppressor metering over the years with various uh, types of meters, you know, to the military standards. And, you know, when I see stuff like this, I'm thinking, uh, I don't know about that. But, eh, yeah. you know, to each their own. They can prove it, hey. I know, regardless, suppressors have definitely come a long way. And then I've also yeah. heard, you know, now with them being able to 3D print with Inconel, mm -hmm. um, also, you know, given us a huge advantage. So, I don't know. Uh, the Keltec uh, Sub-2000 Gen 3, I got to check that out. Um, just kind of cool. So, not only does it now, like, just fold, but you can, like, rotate it so you can still keep, you know, your red dot on it. Stealth Arms came out with the Platypus. I did not check them out. Uh, but so, I've heard that a lot of people like that. So what is that? I didn't even look that up to see what in the heck it was. Handgun. Um, okay. Because I had to look it up too. I, I asked, I was talking to Clint Morgan, uh, again, from Classic Firearms. And I was just like, hey, you know, like, what what did you see that you really liked? And he said that. So I'll, I'll have to look at that. But I did want to cover it just in case anybody else wanted to Google it. And then Henry Supreme Rifle which apparently takes P mags on, uh, and it does have a true free float barrel, internal hammer, threaded barrel. And, uh, and then it uses the standard AR bolt, which. Yeah. The Supreme is an interesting rifle. Um, we were actually over there talking to, uh, some of the company reps and they actually set up new machinery to produce nothing but the Supreme because it's such a unique design. They filed several patents for some of the internal uh, design features, but um, we got the chance to handle it at, at industry day at the range and on the show floor, but the bolt, it, I mean, the, the lever and the bolt is just so smooth. Um, and the internal hammer makes things, um, makes things really, um, light as far as the trigger pull, uh, and very little over travel, but, uh, racking that bolt and, uh, locking it back into place. It's like butter. It's like a well-broken in cowboy action lever action that's been shot, you know, 10,000 times. Right. Um, but just very smooth linkage, uh, very interesting design. But the free floated barrel is what was really uh, kind of piquing my interest because you don't really get that on lever actions a whole lot. Um, and they're all threaded for suppressors now to kind of bring them into the modern age. I think it's going to be a great, great seller for Henry. Yeah, absolutely. And then the whole PMAC things too. That's kind of oh, yeah. cool. Uh, Canic has their Terran Tactical Industries or Innovation. I always screwed up, whatever. The TTI Combat. Mm -hmm. uh, I did interview Adam from Sentry Arms about it. It looks pretty cool. Uh, comes with a bunch of upgrades, and I think it is roughly, I want to say, like $1,100, $1,200 maybe, maybe less. Um, but Taryn uh, came up. Yeah, I mean, he did a, quite a bit of different things to it. If you guys want to check out my interview on that, just head on over to Eva Flannel 1 and 2 Ls on my YouTube channel. Um trying to think what else trying to wrap it up so i'm like man we could talk about all of this forever well i saw that uh century also uh brought in a ton of portuguese g3 parts kits um mm -hmm. like tens of thousands of them and they are building out those g3s in a classic format which yeah. is pretty neat um i think uh, ptr is helping them out with that from what i read 
Um, they also added the AP 5L, which is 16 inch, I guess, a, a 16 inch barrel uh, MP5. So that some people who, you know, might have, you know, different uh, laws, different restrictions in their states can enjoy that MP5 or AP5. You know, I have the AP5. I've been pretty happy with it. Um, but yeah, lots of, I mean, lots of stuff out there. Definitely the industry is hard at work. Um, I guess if you guys want to hear me talk more about some of the newer stuff that launched that SHOT Show, uh, check out uh, Gun Funny, my other podcast. I'll be uh, doing that segment with my sister, kind of, you know, again, just talking about some of the stuff that we saw. Um, but yeah, really cool. Hopefully, you know, you and I will get an opportunity to get our hands on some of the stuff and try it out and then give a more extensive, you know, input. But it is, I mean, it is cool to see what, what everyone's doing. Yeah. The industry is always innovating and there's something new all the time. And you're thinking like, man, that is such a great idea. <laughs> I mean, I do not come up with idea. Yeah, I know. All right. Well, wrapping up, uh, we did have a review, which I greatly appreciate, uh, from iTunes. It is from, uh, guests, guessing me. Five stars. I've been binge listening to the episode since I found your podcast. Since I listen at work with OSHA approved earbuds and have hearing loss, the podcaster's voice dictates how well I can hear. It has a wonderful assertive voice that per that projects well. Eric does well too. I also like the fact that female instructors are gaining prominence. Overall, a very good show that isn't overrun with ads, which I didn't bring up in the beginning of the show, but unfortunately Eric will no longer be with us. Um, and we'll just keep it at that. Um, but I wish him well and Chad is going to be filling in for the next couple of episodes. And, uh, if you guys have anything that, you know, you want us to answer, obviously Chad's extremely knowledgeable. Like there's things that you're saying that I'm like, I mean, you've had years and years of experience and testing and, you know, I mean, you're definitely, so if you guys want to tap into Chad's brain, definitely ask us questions. Um, and then definitely, you know, leave us a review. We really appreciate it. And you guys will hear from us next week. Oh, and if there's also any topics that you'd like us to cover, by all means, let us know. And uh, wrapping up, Chad, for anybody who wants to check out all the stuff that you're doing over at Argos, what are, what's your website, social media, all that good stuff? So you can uh, find us online at argosordnance.com. That's O-R-D-N-A-N-C-E, no I. We're, we're talking about guns, not laws. All right. Um, on social media, pretty much at Argos Ordnance across the board. I'm not a, not really active, but Ava's been pressuring me that I need to be a little bit more active on social media. So I'm going to try to get on that. But just so you guys know, I am a one man band over here at the shop. I do everything from the front end work, bookkeeping, web development, all the hands on work, Cerakote. I mean, I've had customers come to the door and ring my you know, doorbell. And I'm back here like in full Tyvek trying to spray a gun. And I'm like, give me just a minute. Hang on, hang on. I'm back in the back. And I got to go up front. But uh, the shop's kind of appointment only right now, sales and service. Um, but, you know, it's growing word of mouth a lot. But, uh, yeah, follow us on online. Um, you know, you'll be seeing some cool stuff. I usually post Cerakote projects and other things that I'm working on there. Um, but you can find, um, yeah, more information on the website. And definitely sign up for our email list. You get a little coupon in your email. I won't say for what you got to sign up to find out, but, uh, any purchase you make on the site, you get to use that coupon right out the gate. But, uh, I appreciate it, Ava. Thank you much for having me on the show. Of it course. Yeah. Of course. Thank you guys for tuning in. And like I said, we'll see you guys next week. See you.